Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. When we think of El Dorado, most of us go to that fantastic film in the 1990s and early 2000s, which has a banging soundtrack that I can guarantee you, you will not be able to stop hearing in your head throughout this video and for long after you watch this video. But the Golden Quest is something innately human. It goes back thousands of years. For the ancient Greeks, we have the heroic mythological quest of the Golden Fleece, which was made by the wool of a winged ram. And this served as a symbol of authority and kingship under the reign of King Gaertes, before it was stolen by the, quote, hero, Jason, thanks primarily to the help of the king's daughter, Medea. Except the hunt for El Dorado, despite being a concept mythologically speaking, is incredibly real, and it's a gruesome tale involving madmen, cannibalism, decapitation, and filicide. Okay, when you put it like that, there seems to be quite a few overlaps with the aftermath of the mythological Argonauts and the real-life hunt for the mythological El Dorado. So where did the myth of El Dorado originate? Why were people so hell-bent on finding it? And what exactly went down on the journey to finding, quote-unquote, or rather, never finding, the mythological city? Well, this is what we're going to explore in today's video. My name is Chinsia, also known as the Lady of the Library, and welcome here. If you're one of my lovely regulars, I hope you're doing fantastically. And if you're new, buckle up, because we go into the deep depths of dark ancient history. I mean, I say that, but today, what we're discussing isn't so ancient, though the cultural origins of it are. We're actually focusing mostly in the 1500s and the 16th century. So let's get into the myth of El Dorado. So El Dorado is Spanish for the Gilded One, and it is known as the legendary city of gold, supposedly located somewhere in the unexplored depths of South America. The legend likely grew from a tradition of the Muisca people, also known as the Chibchica people, who were a tribe which flourished in what is now known as modern-day Colombia between 600 and 1600 CE. Their people were from what is now the city of Bogota, through the surrounding high mountains and valleys of the Andes. Though lesser known today than the Incas, Aztec and Mayan tribes, their culture was just as advanced. They had their own hierarchical leadership, religious beliefs and advanced farming, craft and trade practices. The Muisca spoke a variation of the Chibchica language, and a fundamental component of their religious practices was sun worship, which is often attributed to their fascination and skill in gold. The legend of El Dorado very likely originates from the initiation of the new chief or ruler known as the Zipa or Zipa in their tribe who is said to have covered his entire body in gold dust before floating out to the centre of the lake Guatavita on what was known as the Deep Muisca Raft. After the rising sunlight struck his golden body, the chief would dive into the lake, washing the gold off him, and would emerge as a human ruler born from the divine golden sun. Back on land, the Muisca people would play music, shout and potentially toss large quantities of gold into the lake to accompany the ceremony. Now, massive disclaimer before getting into the rest of this video. I don't speak Spanish, I've never learned Spanish, I've never heard Spanish before, I've never been to Spain. This is all brand new to me. I found this quite difficult for my little dyslexic brain to get around, but I've really tried with writing down the pronunciations that I've read online so forgive me when it comes to Spanish names and locations, I've done my best. There are six notable accounts detailing this golden man ritual. Three are by the chroniclers, Fernandez de Oviedo, Pedro Ciencia de Leon, 
and Juan de Castellanos, and three by the conquistadors González Pizarro, Jiménez de Quesada, and Sebastián de Benalcazar. Naturally, these accounts vary and are ridiculously embellished, to say the least, by the writers in their own ways, and it's likely that none of them ever witnessed this, as they believe that the ritual actually ceased being pr practiced at least 50 years before any of them were there. However, there are two things that are consistent amongst all of the accounts, the lake and the gold-dusted chief. To go along with the story, we have to this day some artistic figure of pre-Columbian gold votive, the Muisca Raft, also known as the Golden Raft of El Dorado, estimated to have been created between 600 and 1600 CE by the lost wax casting in gold with a small amount of copper. It's adorable and incredibly intricate. The piece has a base of in the shape of a long boat, with dimensions of 19.5 cm by 10.1 cm, and various figures on the raft. The largest figure that stands in the middle apparently represents the chief, which is adorned with a headdress, nose ring and earrings, measuring 10.2 cm, and is surrounded by his soldiers, who carry banners. This wee raft was found by three farmers in 1969, in a cave in the village of Lazaro Fonte in the municipality of Pasca, Colombia. It was tucked inside a ceramic pot adorned with a human figure whose face has sharp teeth. The priest of the municipality protected the piece until it was acquired by Bogota's Gold Museum and where it has become one of its major exhibition pieces and, praise the gods of ancient history, it has never left Colombia. Hilariously speaking, uh, we know that the lost city of gold, El Dorado, is utterly legendary, but to put this into perspective, the ancient city of gold, technically speaking, has more physical, cultural and historical evidence for its existence than Atlantis does. But guess which one people believe in more? Anyway. So, let's talk about this ceremonial crowning of the chief known as El Dorado. How did that evolve into the legend of El Dorado actually being a city, kingdom, or an empire built of gold? Well, we probably have the Spanish conquistadors to blame and thank for this one. I know, no one suspects the Spanish conquistadors. It's 2023, and if we've learned anything over the past three years, it's that the old ways of working aren't working for us anymore. We've been hustling and overworking for other people for years, and it's getting us nowhere closer to the life we want. We don't need to buy into the idea that work is everything or one size fits all. We can subscribe to a new vision of work, to something better, and that's where today's sponsor, Skillshare, can help. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. I'm currently increasing the scope of my online business, expanding to more content creation in the form of videos and podcasting, and I've been using Skillshare to help me. I wanted to reach new audiences through video, and most specifically, uh, Instagram and TikTok. I don't know anything about it, which is why I watched a video for Instagram, tell an engaging story in less than a minute which works through some of the basic ideas around storytelling and how to incorporate different filming and editing techniques. Thinking about our future can be intimidating, so let's take the pressure off by starting small. Whether you're making a career pivot, needing to help with time management, personal branding or productivity, or levelling up your skills, Skillshare is a great ad-free resource for freelancers, creatives and entrepreneurs to help learn new skills and support your growing side hustle. What's more, new premium classes are added every week, so there's always a new dose of inspiration. If you're interested, then the first 1,000 people to use the link in the description box below will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Thank you, Skillshare, for sponsoring today's video, and now let's get back to it. So let's go back to the 15th century. 
Following Col Christopher Columbus's voyage to the New World in 1492, it wasn't long before the quote-unquote New World was filled with colonists and adventurers looking to make a fortune. The men who ravaged the peoples of the New World came to be known as the Conquistadors, a Spanish word meaning he who conquers. But not all Conquistadors were Spanish. For example, we had Pedro de Candia, or Candia, 1485-1542, who was a Greek explorer and artilleryman who accompanied the Pizarro expedition, and Ambrosius Ehinga, 1500-1533, uh, a German man who violently tortured his way across North and South America in 1533 in search of El Dorado. Don't worry, we'll come back to him later. The Pizarro expedition, as I just mentioned, was led by a man called Francisco Pizarro, 1471 to 1541. He, like so many, was fascinated by the potential of the New World. So, in 1510, he joined settlers, led by Alonso de Ojeda, to establish a colony in the South American coast, and they named the settlement San Sebastian. When food supplies began running low, Ojeda left the colony to get supplies, leaving Pizarro in charge. Only 100 of the original 300 settlers survived the tropical heat and diseases, and the remaining survivors returned to Cartagena. After a few excursions and leadership rivalries, Pizarro was eventually made mayor of the newly founded town of Panama and became pretty wealthy, wealthy enough to start funding his own expeditions. In 1526, Pizarro arrived in Peru and heard rumours of a wealthy ruler in the mountains and he wanted his wealth. So he asked King Charles of Spain for permission to conquer this land in the name of Spain, and his request was granted. In 1531, Pizarro and his crew, including three of his half-brothers, sailed from Panama to the city Cajamarca, where the Incan emperor Atahualpa was celebrating his victory over his brother in the Inca Civil War. In November 1532, Pizarro took Atahualpa hostage by luring him to a feast in the emperor's honour. Though Atahualpa had nearly 80,000 soldiers with him in the mountains, he consented to attend the feast with only 5,000 unarmed men. But sadly, 5,000 unarmed men don't stand much of a chance against 200 armed ones. Pizarro met Atahualpa with a friar called Vincente de Valverde, who took the opportunity to urge Atahualpa to convert and accept Charles V as sovereign. Naturally, Atahualpa refused, and that's when they gave the signal to open fire. Pizarro's men slaughtered the 5,000 Incans in less than an hour, and Atahualpa was held captive whilst Pizarro planned to take over the empire. Atahualpa tried to plead for his freedom by tapping into Pizarro's greed, offering him a room full of £13,000 worth of gold and twice that much of silver in exchange for his freedom. Pizarro couldn't re resist the offer, but he wasn't an honest man. Pizarro brought Atahualpa up on the charges of stirring up rebellion, and once he pacified the Incans, he planned to burn Atahualpa at the stake. Still eager to convert him to Christianity, Valverde offered the emperor clemency should he convert. Desperate, Atahualpa complied, so he was forced to convert to Christianity, and then he was executed by strangulation in August 1533. Now Pizarro had a taste for gold and silver. After all, he successfully killed the emperor, who had access to tens of thousands of pounds worth of gold and silver, and this idea of great wealth only spurred on the legends of a lost city built entirely of gold. To add to the legend of El Dorado, following its rumours, 
Gonzalo Jimenez de Quesada, who I'm just going to call Gonzalo from now on if you won't mind, sailed to the New World in 1535 to serve as the chief magistrate for the colony of Santa Marta in northern coast of South America. He led an expedition of 900 men up the Magdalena River into the interior of New Granada, and then, after eight months, he successfully forced the Muisca Zipa of Bogota to flee, and he took over New Granada and the Muisca people. It was through their stories that the El Dorado name popped up, and Gonzalo became intrigued. In 1537, Gonzalo came across Lake Guatavita, where he found a large, but not that impressive, amount of gold. This discovery, though disappointing to Gonzalo, because he was a greedy pain in the butt, only fueled the legitimacy of El Dorado's existence, because this measly amount of gold couldn't be it, surely, especially considering what Pizarro had gotten only a few years prior. So the search for the lost city of gold began. On a side note concerning the lake, uh, there were three attempts to drain it. One in 1545, another in 1580, and another one in 1898. The final attempt was carried out by the British explorer Hartley Knowles, whose expedition team successfully drained the lake to less than four feet deep. But the muddy and slimy bottom, along with the blaring sun, made searching for gold in what was effectively made concrete impossible. However, it wasn't until 1965 that the lake was made a national heritage site and gold searching, draining and exploring of the lake became illegal. So, for the next two centuries, thousands of men would scour South America in search of El Dorado or any other wealthy native empire like the Inca. Gonzalo wasn't very successful conquistador aside from his lake findings. In 1569, he set out with 500 men to search for the mythical El Dorado, uh, only to return two years later with 25 of the original company. In 1541, around 20 years after Cortes conquered the Aztecs and eight years after the Incan emperor Atualpa had been murdered by Pizarro, Pizarro gathered a small force of men and set off from Quito, Ecuador in search of the land of the mythical El Dorado. In his own accounts of his adventure, Pizarro describes El Dorado as a lake, not a, a man or a city, which is likely inspired by the stories that he'd heard about Gonzalo's discovery in a lake. Though to make matters a little more confusing, a different chronicler named Pedro de Chiesa de Leon, who I've mentioned and struggled over the name of already, described Pizarro's expedition, but described El Dorado as a valley, not a lake. I know, strange. Anyway, Pizarro headed east from Quito which, with several hundred conquistadors, and sources vary between 220 and 340 and 4,000 enslaved natives kept in chains and shackles, together with horses, llamas, around 2,000 hogs, and a similar number of hunting dogs. In his quest for El Dorado, he interrogated natives and tortured those who didn't give him answers, which was basically everyone, because what they were looking for didn't exist. After months of trekking through dark and marshy rainforests and mountains, the hogs all died and the supplies began to dwindle. So in December 1541, one of Pizarro's men, Francisco de Oriana, volunteered to take a boat and some 50 men to find food and return with provisions. Well, he was lucky enough to find food, uh, but he didn't return. You see, Oriana and his friend casually came across this great big thing that we now know as the Amazon, but they knew then as the Maranon, and they rode its length for months before reaching the Atlantic on August 26, 1542. And this is according to the book of Expeditions into the Valley of the Amazons. Oriana claimed that he had no choice but to continue once he'd reached the Amazon, but Pizarro believed Oriana was a traitor. 
So without food, Pizarro and his men began to eat their dogs and horses and headed back to Quinto in June, admitting defeat for their search in El Dorado. And this, my friends, is where the German conquistadors entered the chat. You see, back in 1528, the Holy Roman Emperor and Archduke of Austria, Charles V, owed the Welser family, who's a banking family of Augsburg, Germany, 143,000 florins. Now, the Welser family were important, not only as the finances of Charles V, but also because, along with the Fuga or Fuga family, the Welser family controlled large sections of the European economy and accumulated enormous wealth through the trade and the German colonization of the Americas, including the slave trade. So unable to pay off his debts, Charles V licensed the Welser family, the province of Venezuela, reserving for himself 20% of the treasure found and the people they enslaved, and this agreement continued until 1546. This meant that the Germans came the second to the Spanish in terms of expeditions and colonization of South America, all thanks to Germany's colonial rights to the province of Venezuela via the Welsers or Welsers. So this actually reminds me that I didn't really explain at all uh, why the Spanish were so dominant in South America. So before we talk about the violent Ambrosius Echinger, let's give an incredibly oversimplistic explanation as to why the Spanish conquistadors were so prolific in South America. In short, um, Christopher Columbus and Spices. Uh, to elaborate a bit more, uh, we have to go back to the end of the 15th century. You see, the Western European maritime nations were desperate to find a shorter, more affordable passage to the South Seas and the Spice Islands, because spices were the more delicious version of gold at the time. Some had started to believe that a sea route could be found on the western side of the ocean, and they had concerns that Christopher Columbus had located this passage. This was a terrifying idea to the Portuguese who feared this alleged passage could bypass the Portuguese trade monopoly of the coast of West Africa, which had been granted to them under the Treaty of the Alcacovas in September 1479. So for nearly a decade, Columbus lobbied European monarchies to bankroll his quest to discover a western sea route to Asia. Portugal, England and France all refused his requests, with experts telling Columbus his calculations were wrong and that the voyage would take much longer than he was anticipating. Uh, spoiler, they were right. However, when Columbus gave his pitch to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain, the royal experts gave the king and queen the exact same warning, but the king and queen were eager to gain advantage over their rival, Portugal, and expand Catholicism. So they actually ignored all professional warnings and sponsored extensive Atlantic explorations, including Columbus's miscalculated erroneous ideas for Western passage. And whilst he was fully expecting to end up in Asia, uh, he found out the hard way that the Earth was much bigger than he had anticipated, and that's how he ended up in the Americans in 1492, the New World. Columbus made three more voyages over the next decade, establishing Spain's first settlement in the New World on the island of Hispaniola. Columbus's landfall in 1492 opened a floodgate of Spanish exploration of the South America and accelerated the rivalry between Spain and Portugal, and the two powers vied for domination through the acquisition of new lands. Anyway, back to the Germans, and more specifically, Ambrosius Erchinger, the first German captain general confirmed by Seville. He arrived at Coro, a city in Venezuela, on February the 24th, 1529, with Philip von Hutten, the son of a prominent Franconia banker. Within five months, Ambrosius organised a governorship and began exploring and mapping the land. Now, this was happening two years before Pizarro killed Atahualpa, so the El Dorado concept wasn't really known to Ambrosius at the time of his arrival, but there were rumours of a large gold mine on the coast. Venezuelan historian Elo Gonzalez claimed Ambrosius, quote, 
prized neither glory nor fatherland as the Spaniards did. For him, the only important matter was that of gold mines. As soon as he was convinced that mines did not exist in Venezuela, he dedicated his time to the capture of Indians to be sold as slaves." End quote. On June the 9th, 1531, together with 130 men and 40 horses, Ambrosius headed west, Lake Maracaibo, in search of the gold country, with over 100 enslaved natives carrying his supplies. José Fortoy details how, quote, he would take long lines of Indians to carry food and baggage. The poor natives were tied to the same rope, knotted tight around each one's neck. It was impossible to fasten the rope to free any of the carriers without untying a number of others. So, when one of them, overcome by fatigue, would begin to drag along, the brutal governor would order that his head be cut off without untying the rope or even calling a halt. His expedition crossed the Oka Mountains, came over the Valadupa, along the Caesar River, and finally, the Zapatosha Marsh, where they rested for around three months. When they began to travel south, they faced fierce resistance from the indigenous tribes. When Ambrosius reached the Pacaboyes territory and the Peixoto village, he extorted the natives of 24,000 gold castellanos by tightly stockading them with no food and water until someone paid for their freedom making this expedition the most inhumane and cruel in the history of this bloody conquest. Now armed with 405 pounds or 184 kilograms worth of gold, Ambrosius ordered his lieutenant, Inigo de Vasconia, 24 soldiers and many enslaved natives to carry the gold back to Coro, whilst he journeyed further south, and he expected Vasconia to return back to him within three months of their separation. Um, Kel Surprise, Vasconia's party got lost. You see, all the men were exhausted and starving, and many on the brink of death. The situation only grew much more gruesome. You see, in dire need of food, three men found a foraging native woman, who they killed and then ate, before they turned on the native carriers and then ate them too. Under these dire circumstances, Vasconia, now lacking men to carry the gold because they kind of ate most of them, he decided to bury the gold and mark the location with signs on surrounding trees. In what could be argued as poetic justice, the buried gold was never found again. Meanwhile, Ambrosius was making his way home when he and his men were attacked by the Chitarreros on May the 27th, 1533. He and Captain Esteban Martin fled into a low-lying ravine, where they were pinned down by Indians shooting arrows. Ambrosius was struck in the throat by a curare-tipped arrow, and despite the attentions of Augustine father Vincente de Requejada to remove the arrow, suck the poison from his neck, and even apply the human grease of a dead native to the wound, Ambrosius died on May the 31st, 1533, and was buried under a tree. The expedition returned without him to Coro. The speed at which people learn from bloodthirsty and brutal failed expeditions is slow, to say the least. You see, despite all the deaths and inhumane torture, there was clearly gold out there. After all, when they heard of the galleon Santa Maria de Campo docking in Seville on January the 9th, 1534, filled with millions of pesos in gold and silver bullions stolen from Atahualpa, the 13th and last Inca leader, the beliefs in El Dorado's existence only strengthened. Expositions composed of recent arrivals from Europe as well as veterans of the conquest set out in all directions to search for it, with merely a word of mouth of conquistadors fueling their convictions. Another monstrous conquistador of note was Lope de Aguirre, who called himself the Wrath of God, Prince of Freedom, Kingdom of Tierra Ferme. 
Okay, so we know nothing about his life before he arrived in Peru in 1544 as part of the Spanish suppression of Indian rebellions. And he really didn't make himself known until 1560, when he joined an expedition led by Pedro de Ursua to find El Dorado, which they believed was located at the headquarters of the Amazon River. Now, the environment in Peru had changed a lot since the 1530s. You see, in the early 1540s, King Charles V sent Blanco Nunes Vila as his new viceroy to enforce laws to end what was known as the Encomiandas, which was a Spanish labour system that rewarded conquerors with enslaved non-Christian people. As such, encomenderos were rewarded feudal slavery that permanently granted them large estates and gave them the power to control entire populations of enslaved natives. It may be hard to believe, considering everything we've heard so far, but the encomienda system was controversial in Spain from the very beginning. But no one really cared for the natives' well-being or because they allowed it to continue until the Tino Cachinque Enriquillo rebelled against the Spaniards between 1519 and 1533. Then, in 1538, realising how serious this rebellion was for the safety of the Spaniards, Charles V decided to change the laws and step in. Due to the extent of the realisation of the abuse happening, new laws were passed to regulate and gradually abolish the system in South America, as well as to reiterate the prohibition of enslaving Native Americans. Now, Aguirre took his side against the wealthy encomendoros, and over the following decade, control of the colony passed back and forth between the rebels and the royalists until the latter finally won in 1559. This left a lot of soldiers with nothing to do. So Viceroy Andres Hontado de Mendoza decided to give them a wee project to take their minds off not being able to fight anymore. And that wee project was go find El Dorado. Hurtado appointed 34-year-old Pedro de Ursua to lead 300 Spaniards and hundreds of enslaved Peruvians into the interior of the Amazon, with the interior motive of emptying Peru of the most violent and dangerous members of the Spanish population, including Lope de Aguirre. By this point in life, Aguirre was a bitter, fortuneless man in his late 50s, and so, with nothing else to do for or going for him, in that matter, uh, he signed up for the expedition, bringing his daughter, Elvira, along with him. Now, there was a big red flag that Ursua ignored from the very beginning. His ulterior motive was to purge Peru of the most violent Spaniards by taking them with him on an expedition, which is sort of a naive oversight there, because obviously none of these men could be trusted and they were ticking time bombs. Regardless, he took these men hundreds of miles up the Mebrenon River in canoes stolen from local tribespeople, of course, uh, and they were obviously finding nothing, and the men knew that their legs were being pulled, and they started to get frustrated. By the time they reached the territory of Marchaparro tribe, Aguirre had gathered a small band of mutineers together to overthrow Ursua and replace him with Don Fernando de Guzman, who was easy to manipulate. On January the 1st, 1561, the conspirators stormed into Ursua's tent and stabbed him to death. Guzman had a document drawn up justifying their actions to the royal authorities, but Aguirre, now second in command, signed it, quote, Lope de Aguirre, the traitor. Uh, to his shocked companions, he explained, quote, to have killed one who represented the king's royal person, clothed with royal powers. Do you think that with documents concocted by ourselves that we shall be held blameless? Then, to Aguirre's frustration, Guzman wanted to continue looking for El Dorado, whilst he wanted to head back to Peru under a new route which would prevent them from double-crossing the tribe's people that they barely escaped previously on their way here. Guzman rejected this idea, 
uh, which probably wasn't the wisest move, considering this man literally signed his name on a document that you wrote, the traitor, because Kel Surprise uh, agreeably killed Guzman, and he just kept killing from that point onwards. Aguirre killed anyone of noble blood on the expedition, he also killed Ursua's mistress and the priests, and then he left most of the native enslaved Peruvians to die in the jungle. To say he went insane would be an understatement. You see, this is when he started calling himself, quote, the wrath of God, prince of freedom and king of tierra firma, and even claimed sovereignty over Peru and Chile, and wrote a letter to King Philip II of Spain in July, declaring his independence from Spain. He wrote, quote, Denaturalizing ourselves from our land, Spain, we make the most cruel war against you that our power can sustain and endure. I am certain that there are few kings in hell, because there are few kings, but if there were many, none would go to heaven. Even in hell you would be worse than Lucifer, because you all thirst after human blood, but I don't marvel nor make much of you." The rest of the expedition team wasn't really on board, to say the least. The Spanish forces surrounded him in the town of Barquisimeto, Venezuela, and his men deserted him en masse. All he had left at the end of it all was his daughter who he naturally stabbed to death to, quote, spare her the torture of being trialled as a traitor. I know, it's like we're reading Medea. Although Aguirre didn't fly away on the back of a dragon, instead, on October the 27th, he was shot to death and then chopped up into quarters. His body parts were sent to neighbouring towns as a warning of treason, and his skull was kept as a souvenir of sorts. One which reminded everyone of the cruelty and insanity of imperialism. Thank you so much for listening to today's video on El Dorado. I hope you enjoyed it. There was a lot more we could have gone into, but I thought I'd keep it here at the 35 minute mark or so. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. I greatly appreciate it. And thank you to all of my Patreons who are on the screen right now. I really appreciate all of your support and thank you again for accepting an audio only. It's much easier for me to do it audio version rather than video when I don't know how to pronounce a lot of the words. I keep pausing and stopping and writing it down and trying it again, so thank you for your patience. And thank you again to everyone who send in recommendations and suggestions in my Google form at the bottom in the document form below. And if you want to support this channel, please consider checking out my Patreon page. Also consider checking out Skillshare because every click and sign up really helps me. Everyone who has a free trial of Skillshare really helps out the channel. And you can follow me over on Instagram and over on Twitter as well. Until next week, be happy, be healthy, and remember, books save lives, so keep reading.